Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing Grab yourself a drink cause it's joined up writing Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 76 today with Rebecca Bradley talking about her excellent police procedurals, her background as a police officer and how she manages to write through physical adversity and chronic pain. There'll also be time for another trip back to Book Bloggers Corner with show regular Catherine Sunderland reviewing Twin Truths by Sheelan Roger. Before that, I wanted to say thanks for the lovely response I've had to a recent Joined Up Writing blog post entitled, Thanks for Listening, How Can I Make Things Better? If you haven't had a chance to read and comment yet on that, so uh, you can do that by heading over to the blog, joinedupwriting.co.uk, and take a look. But the gist of the post was me taking time to thank all my listeners, past, present and future, and to ask for more feedback on how I can continue to improve the show. I got some really lovely comments on Twitter and I wanted to thank Ingrid who left a really insightful comment on the actual post. Aside from saying how helpful she finds the show in helping her own writing confidence and things like that, she also gave me some honest feedback about the epilogue, our short in-between bonus episodes and saying that she found them a little bit meh and not as useful as the main interviews. I really appreciate that honesty. Uh, And she'd also like to hear more about the editing process and on the back of that I'm hoping to have an editor on the show very soon. I'm also keen to hear more views on the epilogue and the other content in the show and uh, I'll get my thinking cap on as to how I can continue to add value to all those different things. So aside from checking out that post, I'll include a link to that in the show notes and leaving your comments there. The other help I need is for you to make sure that you're actually subscribing to the show on whatever your chosen podcast app is. And I also need to remind you that the easiest way you can support me is to please leave a rating and review, particularly on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, as it helps other people to find the show. I cannot stress how important it is. If you value this show and you want me to keep going as I'm going, then please take two minutes, just leave a really quick rating and review. Just go to iTunes or Podcasts, whichever way you access it. You can normally do it on your phone. If you scroll down to the bottom when you're on the actual show link, you'll see something that says reviews and you should just be able to hit leave a review. Um, And even if you can't be bothered to leave a review, just leave me a rating. But a review would really, really help, even if it's just one or two sentences. And I also do check back there to get some feedback on what you want to improve in the show. Um, You know, authors realise the impact that book reviews can have and podcasts are just the same. Uh, And finally, the last way you can help and also get a gift back from the show is to take advantage of the free audiobook download from Audible that you get for being a listener of the show. The link is in the show notes, but there really is nothing to lose. You get a free audiobook to keep, to download and keep, and it's easy to cancel if you don't fancy keeping it going after that initial 30-day trial. Um, Audible is amazing. It's helped me to find and read fiction and non-fiction books when I'm driving, walking or making the dinner. So go to audibletrial.com forward slash joined up to get your free book and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Okay, so let's uh, stop messing around. Let's get to the meat and potatoes, the, uh, the main course of today's podcast, which is an interview with Rebecca Bradley. So after 16 years service, Rebecca was medically retired from the police, where she finished as a detective constable in a specialist unit. She's now the author of three novels in the D.I. Hannah Robbins series, Shallow Waters, Made to be Broken and Fighting Monsters, with more standalones to come too. Rebecca's personal story and how she overcomes some difficult physical challenges are really inspiring to all writers and creatives, so I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. 
Okay, Rebecca, thanks a million for joining us on Joined Up Writing Podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to do it. How's everything going? You look like you've been very, very busy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, No problem. Yeah, I try to keep myself busy. Um, I'm currently writing the fourth Hannah Robbins book Mm -hmm. and trying to prepare for a release of a standalone that I've got coming out in May. So... Right. Plus, um, I've also got some non-fiction um, projects that I've got running that I try and keep that I'm trying to juggle as well. So yeah, I do try to keep busy. You do well. You don't try. You do. I, I <laughs> do f- follow your blog and everything else. You're really, really, really productive. So why don't you start off just by telling us about you, the book that's come out most recently that's kind of out in the world, which I think is is that Fighting Monsters. It is, yeah, Yeah. Fighting Monsters. It's the third in the D.I. Hannah Robbins series, which is set in Nottingham. Um, There's been quite a long period of time between the second one and the third one because I decided to write the standalone. Um, So there's been quite a long period of time between um, Made to be Broken and Fighting Monsters, but I released Fighting Monsters in February. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's set in... Nottingham, yeah. and it's based around a a gang leader who is at the start of the novel. He's just found not guilty of the murder of a police officer, mm-hmm. um, which obviously people aren't happy about mm-hmm. because if I think if he's been charged, he's obviously guilty. Yeah, no and then smoke the next day, fire and all that stuff. Obviously, yeah. Um, and then the next morning, he's found dead in his car with a bullet in his head. Um, and then it goes from there. Um, Brilliant. Obviously, the investigation has to consider whether it's family members of the police officer or whether it could be police involvement. Um, and the the logline for it is, where do you turn when you can't trust the police? Brilliant. So, so yeah. A, so it's the police procedural, but there's a bit of a mystery there at the centre of it as well. There is, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So you, yeah. so you mentioned your standalone. So did, how how did that come about? Was that obviously because you, you, you've written, as you mentioned there, that's your third book in the Hannah Robbins series. You've also got the fourth that's coming out in the not too distant future, and you also took time out to do a standalone. So how did the standalone one come out? Was that just like an idea that was calling you whilst you were doing the series? Yeah, I'm really excited about this standalone. Um, It's about a cop who acquires prosopagnosia while he's a serving police officer. Um, Prosopagnosia is also known as face blindness. Mm -hmm. So you know the disorder where you don't recognise somebody by their face. You can't recognise faces. So if you looked in a mirror, you couldn't even recognise yourself no matter how many times you see yourself. Yeah, is that like a? Do you sometimes do some people with certain types of autism have similar thing as well with that? Um, I don't know. I think so. I think autism's yeah. linked to quite a few few medical issues, to mm. be honest. Mm. Um, but yes, um, so he has a car accident while he's on duty because you can be either you can either be born with it or you can acquire it through a stroke or a head injury uh, and i spoke to a couple of people from the prosopagnosia charity yeah uh one person had been born with it and the other uh guy had had a stroke and he'd acquired it so um so my cop um he had an accident and he acquires it and he returns to work without telling anybody that he's got it but then he goes out on duty and he witnesses a murder and he comes to face to face with the killer who escapes and he's the only person to have seen him. That's a great idea. Obviously, yeah. And obviously he can't describe him. No, no. <laughs> because so. he's got this condition. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. How, did that, how did that come to you? Did you end up just reading something about that condition and that sparked it off? Yeah, I've known about it for a while. Um but you know, as a writer, these you're always getting ideas that float into your head and float out again. Definitely. Um, and you 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 just write them down, and you've got a notepad filled with different snippets, different lines, and ideas and things. And then one day, that just kind of floated in, and it was one of those ideas that stuck that you knew mm-hmm. you could work with because they either float in and then float away, or they stick. They become sticky. 
uh, and you know that you can do something with it. And it was one of those that just became sticky and it wouldn't wouldn't let go. Um, so I just had to stop writing the series um, and, and start tapping away at that one. So presumably you frustrated you hannah robbins fans why they had to wait a little yes, bit yes unfortunately yes <laughs> but, you... but hopefully it'll be worth it absolutely so and and so that's coming out in may did you say yes 8th of may it's uh, set for release and what's that called dead blind dead blind yeah that's a good title it's a good title so why don't you take take a step back for a, a minute then so why don't you tell me sort of how you got into writing in the first place did you like writing when you were younger tell me about that um, I think I was always one of those, you know, those people who th- say, oh, I'd love to write a book. Mm-hmm. There's, there's loads of us out there. Those that never do, but they say, oh, I'd love to write one, but I've never got the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I was coming up to um, a significant birthday. I was mm-hmm. getting older. 21, yeah. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> um, and... I thought, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. I mean, before that, previous to that, I had attempted a first chapter several times mm. and, and got no further than a couple of pages and then and never gone back to it. Um, and when I started, um, when I came up to this birthday, I thought, I have to, if I'm going to do it, I have to do it now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just that. I just thought, I want to do it. And if I... If I'm going to do it, I've got to do it now because I'm getting older now. Um, and it was just the birthday that prompted me to sit down and do it. And pushed you. What What do you yeah. think it was, you know, before, like, because that's a really, really common problem that you mentioned there, you know, writing a few pages or some people write a few chapters or even half a book or whatever. What What was it that was holding you back? Because you're obviously not short of ideas and things like that. Was it self-doubt or what was it? Originally, why did mm, I keep yeah. dropping it? Um, I think it was the idea, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was the right time to do it. I don't, I didn't have, I wasn't fully committed to it. Mm-hmm. It was just, I fancied the idea of writing a novel, but I didn't have enough about me. I didn't, it was more the idea of doing it that I liked rather yeah. than the sit down and do that, put the hard work in. Um, and did it, when you actually got a crack in and you really got stuck in, were you surprised at just how much hard work it was? Or was it, you know, you thought, well, I thought this would be hard and it is. <laughs> yeah, because I was working full time. So, mm-hmm. um, and it, it took me a good couple of years to write the first one. Um, uh, and I'd got a family as well. So, yeah, it surprised me actually how because you've just got to keep plodding along and, and sitting down and when you've got the time. I mean, now I will always say try and write every day. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's only just 15 minutes you've got, do it because then the story stays in your head. But when I first started, I wasn't doing that. And it would be periods of time that, that I wasn't writing. And so by the time I sat down again, I had to kind of refresh my memory about where I was in the story and what was happening. Whereas if you sit down every day and even if it is just for 15 minutes, the the story is constantly in your head and you don't lose track of what you're doing. And it makes it so much easier. Um, But because I wasn't doing it every day and I maybe do it once a week sometimes because I was that busy. Mm -hmm. It was it was so much harder to, to do it that way. Completely, it's something I've actually been talking about in the last couple of introductions of the of the podcast because it's kind of something I've had myself. It's like in your mind, especially when you work, uh, you know, you got a busy job or whatever. You kind of build up this special time that you're going to find to write. You know, you're like, right, uh, you know, it might be a whatever a Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning or whatever it is and you're like right I know I'm going to have like three hours where I can go oh I'm just going to really really focus on the writing I'm going to sit down it's going to be really productive but you know like you say even if you've been doing it more regularly you probably haven't done it for a week and then you sit down you've got to get your head in the scene or in the book you've got to remember where you were before and where you're going um 
and it's this, been the same for myself because I was finding it hard to fit in these kind of, you know, I will do an hour or out, write, a, I will definitely have to write a thousand words or whatever it was. Whereas yeah. I, I kind of thought to myself, right, let's be a bit more realistic, you know, going through a busy time at work or whatever. I'm just going to say, I'm going to do a minimum of 20 minutes every day, regardless. I'm going to do 20 yeah. minutes on it. And what I found was most days I did a lot more than 20 minutes, but just setting that thing and saying, well, you've only got to do 20 minutes because you, you know, yourself, you, a lot of the time it, it is time. It's finding the time, but it's also finding the, the energy and the inclination because you're tired yeah. you, after a yeah. full day's work. But if away. you think it's just, a, if you're just going to sit down for 15 minutes or so, you, you think you fool yourself into sitting down, don't you? Exactly. Yeah you trick yourself you have to yeah. do loads of stuff like it's a bit i did do a similar thing with exercise it's like you just sort of have to not oh, what's that <laughs> well yeah i know exactly what you mean at the minute but in in better days when i've been a bit more fit and i've actually been doing some exercise it's a similar sort of thing i have to sort of trick myself into it um yeah. so yeah I find, I find the same sorts sorts of things so w- what was the first book was the first book that you wrote actually the first book that you published it was, um, which I know is fairly unusual. It's not unheard of, but it is fairly unusual. Um, I did get an agent with the first book, and um, I got some um, positive rejections from publishers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I parted ways with my agent. And I just felt that, I was just really taken with the the characters. I didn't want to let them go. Um, so I had it edited um, and I published it and it did really, really well. And I, I was the best thing I did, to be honest. Um, I've got readers that, that love the series. Um, so, yeah, I think as long as you have it edited, mm-hmm. you work with good editors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I believed in the characters and I believed in the story. Um, well, yeah, you've obviously, as you say, you've been really, really successful. So, uh, say, for people that don't know, you've kind of independently published, um, you know, these novels. And as you say, so you started out, so the thing that I, I didn't really know that much about, so you, you initially, you, you got an agent. So how did you go about doing that? Was it the usual thing of you sending out letters and, like, the first three chapters or...? Yeah, I just did it the the usual way mm-hmm. um ch- checked what their submission guidelines were um followed the submission guidelines everybody wants different they all want a different amount of chapters or mm-hmm. pages sending in um different length synopsis mm-hmm. sending in mm-hmm. um and did that and um signed with an agent um and we came close with a couple but um it, it didn't get signed um so there, there, there was some positive um, feedback in yeah, it, that yeah. they like my writing. Um, well, it's a really, really common which, story. Again, it, it's, yeah. it's come up quite a few times on the podcast. With people, either not not always necessarily people that have ended up independently publishing, but even people that eventually did get traditionally published, but after a long, long, long period of time, you know, and it's the and it's the same book. It's not like they didn't get that book published and that went away. They still end up getting that book published, but it took a lot longer than they expected. And sometimes it was one or two different agents, and sometimes they were almost published it with a particular publisher, and then it fell at the last um, hurdle. Um, so it is obviously it is it, it is a difficult thing to do. So obviously, without wanting to uh, slag off your your agent or anything like that, but what what was the particular thing that made you think? Well, actually, you know, I think I can. Why why was it that you kind of thought about parting ways? Was it just a you didn't kind of it wasn't a good fit for you or? Um, my agent wanted um, a different book um, to go back to the an editor that had shown an interest in my writing, but not that particular story. I see. But I thought that the, I was particularly taken with that, that story. I thought it was strong enough. Mm. Um, so I, I wanted that. Yeah, I was a bit stubborn, to be honest. Well, um, well, well, it's a your, bit of a stubborn, stubborn well, it's your book. I think it depends on what the nature of the changes are. Because, again, had recently had a couple of shows ago, I had... Uh, 
Richard Rippon on, and he's published with a small press now, a literati press, a, a small independent press. And um, when he'd had a similar thing with a with a bigger publisher, and he'd written well the book that he's now released, Lord of the Dead, which is like a serial killer thriller type thing. And I think I, th- I can't remember the specifics, but it was something as um, major as literally changing the gen, completely changing the gender of his protagonist. Um, you know, flipping the whole thing yeah. round, which obviously, as you know, that's 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 literally a, that's an entire rewrite of the of the book, you know, from start to finish. And he was just, well, no, this is this is my character, and this is the story that I want to tell. And he'd got an idea for another story for yeah. a follow up and everything as well. Um, and it was kind of, you know, understandably, yeah. it was a red line, and it's completely understandable, isn't it? It's your it's your baby at the end of the yeah. day. And changing gender, it's not just about turning he to she or she to he. Yeah. The, the um, male and a female character behave differently in Entirely, different yeah. circumstances. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a complete rewrite. Um, and if you believe in your characters, you, as the author, you do have the last word on, on the book. Mm. Um, so it is about having faith, um, ultimately, in, in what you've written. So I wouldn't obviously suggest everybody just disagrees with editors and agents and and what no, have I you. think it, I think you have to take it on a case by case basis, obviously. Yeah. And and it depends, you know, what it is, uh, what the thing with it is. Well, it's funny because I'm I sort of find myself in a similar quandary. I haven't. I'm I'm just finishing my what I hope will be my first novel, uh, published novel, one way or another. Um, but I kind of made a decision a few months ago. I was like, I'd um and I was like, no, no, I, I'm going to independently publish. I'm going to put the first one out oh. myself. And I was, how <laughs> to be honest, I was like, I'd made my mind up. I'd got a date in my mind and that was going to head for a deadline. And then over the last few months, I've kind of, you know, because I've spoken to lots of different people. Obviously, everyone's got a slightly different opinion on it, depending on yeah. a lot of the time, depending on whether they're traditionally published or whether yeah. they're self-published or whatever. Um, but I do find myself, you know, some people have said, well, why don't you just see about, see if you could get an agent first and have an agent look over it because that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, a bit like yourself because you did get, you did go through that stage of it. So you did have somebody that looked at your writing, liked your writing, liked, liked your story, championed what you did, you know, kind of yeah. put you around. So presumably you wouldn't change that if you could go back or would you no I don't think I would because that gave me more confidence in it to be honest because you had somebody in the industry saying yes this is um, good enough mm. um, so no I don't think I, I don't think I would change I don't think I'd change anything to be honest mm. um, I don't think I'd change the fact that it was rejected um, I don't think I'd change the fact that I applied uh, sub- submitted to agents um no because yeah you it's it gives you confidence if somebody says yeah we we think this is is great yeah because there's i think there's always that worry especially with your first one is like you know you know am i just deluded am i just putting <laughs> am i just putting this out into the world and you know i i think this is you know this is going to be fine and you know other people and say oh does he actually think he can write or whatever so and i think a lot of people kind of go through that that kind of self doubt um and sometimes you know some people need that uh you know that that arm around the shoulder to say no 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 this is good mm. or whatever and some people don't but obviously you've made obviously the books speak for themselves i mean they look apart from anything else they look really great they look really professional you, you've obviously you've done great in terms of sales and everything else um, you make a living from your writing now as well. Um, you know, you've got great Amazon um, ratings and reviews and everything else. So they kind of speaks for the speak for self. But you know, you're not doing it as a a one woman band, are you? You are approaching it as a professional uh, uh, product. So tell us a little bit about what goes into it as regards. You've already kind of alluded to the fact that you use um, an editor, but you've obviously got professional cover design and all that kind of thing. Talk us through that. Um. Yeah, I think you do need um, a whole team behind you, um, to be honest. You do a lot yourself, but, um, I mean, I heard people say that they couldn't self-publish because of all the work that they have to do themselves, whereas going traditional, um, the publishers do it for you. But doing it yourself as an indie um, author, 
you're, you're still outsourcing that work to be done by somebody else. You still have to have um, ed- editors. The only thing that you're doing yourself is actually researching and sending it out to them. So I've got um, a structural editor, a copy editor, uh, and a proofreader. So it goes through three lots of editing. Um, I've, and then I've got my cover designer. Um, I have my website professionally designed. So it's it's an inve- it's quite a big investment though, isn't it, in yourself? It is. Um, but I think if you're doing it yourself, you have to... People can tell if you haven't invested in it. Mm. I mean, um, they can tell by looking at the cover if it's been made. I, I certainly couldn't create my own cover. Um, some people can create their own covers. Um, I couldn't do it. Yeah, if you can't have a, if you can't afford the custom cover, mm-hmm. then the, a lot of designers on their sites do ready-made covers. And so that, um, yeah, I know what you mean, like a template yeah. almost. Yeah. So there are always ways to um, bring the cost down a little bit. There's no excuse for kind of putting out a, my, my first day on Photoshop effort. No. <laughs> no, I, I can't even open Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, like you say, that's perhaps just as well, given some people's uh, design talent. So it's, it's, it's horses for course, isn't it? So obviously, as I mentioned, you've, so if you're doing really, really well, um, as I say, on Amazon and stuff like that. So what, what was, I mean, what is your approach to marketing and pro- promotion? Again, was that something that you, you know, already had a lot of experience in or did you learn a lot of new skills? Have you kind of got any kind of off the top of your head kind of tips or things in particular that seem to work well for you? Um, before I released my debut, which is Shallow Waters, I was on social media using it socially, which is the word people forget when Absolutely, they're uh, yeah. um, talking about books and authors. Um, so and I engaged in the, I had a blog and I, for, like I say, it took me a good couple of years to even write the book. So in all that time, I was engaged in the book community with bloggers and readers and authors. And I just immersed myself in the world that I wanted to become a part of. So when it came time to releasing it, I had a lot of support um, and had a lot of people that helped me. So I think... I know people say that social media doesn't sell books, but I think other people can help you sell books. Mm -hmm. And if you um, genuinely make friendships within that world, then you will get a lot of support um, if you're supportive of other people as well. Absolutely. I don't know whether you've listened to it. There's another podcast called uh, Launch. Um, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's yeah, it's really yeah. it's uh, it's really good. And basically, it's, it's like seven parts or something. And uh, it's by a guy called John August. But he takes you from him deciding to write a book through to getting an agent, through to sending out the first chapters, getting edits back. It literally takes you through every part of the process, right through to it being published and things. But one of the big things, I mean. Uh, Obviously, that's traditionally published that he's talking about, but a lot of the principles are more, you know, exactly the same. But they talk. One of the biggest things they're talking about is this idea of hand selling. Obviously, I'm talking about physical bookshops, but the but the idea is the same. And they found that the biggest impact is this idea of hand selling, which is in a bookshop. If the person working in the bookshop genuinely likes your book themselves or if you've bothered to reach out to them and you've spoken to them and you've got a bit of a relationship with them and said oh you know you might like this book because x y and z they will have much more impact than anything else that you can do you know yeah then putting it on the front table or going and putting it in people you know which is the same principle with the social media thing as you say if you've actually got people that like you and genuinely like what you do and believe in what you do they're so much more powerful than than a, an algorithm or a, a Facebook ad or whatever, aren't they? Yeah, um, I just don't understand people that are on social media and all you see um, are Buy tweets. My book. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, it's awful. It's an awful place when that's all you can see. Mm. Um, it, 
it should be about just talking to people uh, and making friends in the community that you want to be a part of. Absolutely. And have you got, a, a, well, I, I know you have because I, I follow you on Twitter and stuff. So presumably you've got quite a, a good network in terms of book bloggers and things like that as well. Um, yeah, because I've been on there for a few years now, um, probably nine, ten years. Um, so, yeah, I'm friends with quite a few of them. Um, plus I use Facebook and there's some Facebook groups um, as well as Twitter. Um, so it's just about keeping in touch and talking about books, which is what everybody loves, um, as well as doing the other stuff that people talk about, um, mailing lists. Um, I'm just dipping my toe in Amazon advertising at the minute, mm-hmm. um, so I don't know what that's going to be like. So that's um, a whole new thing, presumably, that you kind of have to get your head around and learn, is yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I see with me, you, with it's you, more about being personal. Yeah, yeah. And I see with your mailing list on your website. So you part of your strategy with that, isn't it? You you give away. Is it a free book? Uh, yes. Um, there's there's a prequel to Shallow Waters, mm. um, and you can get that free um, on my website. Um, it's a novella, not a, um, which is about twenty five thousand words. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can get that. Um, on my website uh, and that's that's set just before the series starts something else that you had to find the time to write yes <laughs> <laughs> well on that subject i know uh, and again you can tell me if you're not comfortable chatting about this or whatever but we've kind of alluded well we've kind of alluded to it and we kind of haven't in this interview but anybody that kind of follows you or whatever will know that in your previous life if you like before you were a full-time writer you were uh, in the police force um and I think what a lot of people know if they visit your blog or anything else is that you, you know, you had to leave the police force through health reasons. You, you made that decision to, to leave. So you suffer with quite a serious chronic illness, don't you? I mean, I don't know how comfortable you yeah. are talking about it, but if you are comfortable about it, just tell us what that is and, and kind of how that has kind of impacted what you do on a daily, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's fine. I don't mind talking about it at all. Um, yeah, I, ju- I, uh, Joined the police quite late in life. I was, um, I'm going to give my age away if I say too much about <laughs> what I thought I was. Um, I was 29 when I joined. Yeah. Um, and I, I I did 15, coming on 16 years before I had to retire, mm-hmm. um, uh, a medical retirement. Um, I have a genetic disorder. And even though it's genetic, it wasn't picked up until I was a lot older because mm-hmm. it was originally picked up in my son. Um, and it's called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've got a secondary one, which is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, but Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a connective tissue disorder, which your whole body is made up of connective tissue it's what holds you together mm-hmm. um it's your bones your skin your ligaments your internal organs everything is made up of connective tissue um so anything can go wrong with my body um the type that i've got it means your joints tend to be looser um and the main problem that i have the main joint that gives me problems is where my head sits on top of my neck Mm -hmm. is loose. Um, So I get the most excruciating pain at the top of my head, base of my neck. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And so my head is like, it's like carrying around a base, uh, not a base, a bowling ball. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm in, I'm in constant pain. Um, The POTS, postural static tachycardia uh, means I, I get dizzy if I stand up too long and Mm -hmm. could pass out. Um, So, yeah, it kind of made policing a bit of an issue. (laughs) (laughs) So understandable, yeah. Well, I should uh, imagine. I should imagine it's made lots of things uh, an issue. I mean, with writing, people think, well, yeah, writing, you're sitting down, et cetera, et cetera. But from the symptoms that you kind of described, I should imagine that is 
a challenge as well obviously especially if it's your head and your neck where if you're sitting at a computer for long periods of time so I uh, look when I uh, I kind of did a bit of research before the interview and looked at some of the things you talked about before but I know I think you kind of employ that little and often technique yourself don't you mm. as regards you know as much as anything else because out of necessity so you know how does it kind of affect your day-to-day as regards your writing yeah I've had to um figure it out as I go along because I can't that was one of the problems I was a detective in a specialist unit when I left dealing with sexual exploitation mm-hmm. um, and a lot of the work was desk based mm-hmm. um, and I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't sit upright for long periods of time. And obviously that does impact me being at home and trying to be a writer as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because being upright, having my head um, on top of my neck um, is impactive. So yeah, I um, and I found something that works for me now, which is um, what we mentioned earlier. I'll set my uh, an alarm on my phone to write for 15 minutes. And when I first started doing it, I was doing about 320 words in that 15 minutes. And mm-hmm. now I can do just over 500. That's brilliant. So um, if I do, all I need to do is two 15 minute slots throughout the day. And I've done a thousand words in that day. Mm. But I try and do more than that to keep my word count up. Um, but it's not too impactive on me because we're just talking about 15 minute mm. slots. So, um, do you like to take a break the at day. the end of the 15 minutes and not come back to it for a while? Or yeah, if I'm if I'm in the middle of something that I really don't want to walk away from, I'll carry on for another five minutes. But I won't go I won't go much longer than half an hour mm-hmm. um, because you know that you'll pay for um, it. It's yeah, it's really bad. Mm. Um, but at least I know that I can go back and I can just do it again later in the day. And I know that I can keep my word counts up. Um, I can do at least a thousand words a day. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes two thousand words a day. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though my life is restricted, I can still be I can still get quite a bit of work done now I figured out how to go around doing it well I think it puts anybody else to shame like <laughs> anybody else that's kind of moaning that's saying oh I can't find the time to do it and obviously you've proven it uh, like I say it's kind of come out on uh, you know of unfortunate situation and it's a necessity of it you've had to find a you know ways around it to do it but obviously a lot of it is to do with force of will as well and the fact that you you didn't want to give up on it um to be honest writing um producing books it's what keeps me going if if i didn't have that i think i would just it would just drive me insane Mm -hmm. um being stuck in the house all the time um being so restricted Mm -hmm. um just it it gives me a life because creating these worlds and these characters um having readers that read and enjoy it um it's just fantastic hearing from readers um it just makes my day um but just being able to to get up and know that i'm going to be able to to do some work throughout the day um yeah it yeah it keeps me going it's kind of, it's almost it's like an escape isn't it as much as anything else presumably you can in one way or another you're kind of getting out into the world as you say these worlds that you're creating yeah definitely um yeah i can do anything i want to do when i sit down and um and type and even when i'm not typing um i'm thinking about um the book that i'm working on or future ones or reading other ones and trying to improve just by reading somebody else Mm -hmm. or getting other ideas just from reading the books um yeah have you tried dictation or anything like that yeah i I couldn't get on with it that it seems to use a different part of your brain Mm, i find the same i've tried it a couple of times um and it yeah it seems to use a different part of your brain um and i can't i can't get on with it at all I you tried it, it, did you? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I can't say that I've tried it like properly, properly tried it. You know, I think most people that you talk, I know like Joanna Penn is like a really, really big 
um, proponent of it and stuff. Yeah. And, and I, th- I know from uh, reading stuff that she's talked about before and, and hearing her on a podcast, she basically says that if you're going to have a go at it, then you really, really need to stick at it. It's hard when you first start yeah. doing it. But uh, I think there's a, a, another thing to come to get over with it is um, that kind of feeling stupid almost. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously... You know, we all know what it's like when you first read out you, what you've actually written, what you've actually sat and you've you've written in your head and you've put it onto the page when you read it out loud for, for the first time sometimes, depending on what it is, is, that can make you feel a bit self-conscious. But I should imagine even sitting on your own in a room, saying it out loud, I would probably feel quite self-conscious thinking that that sounds... I'm not. I'm not sure I could get the flow going. I'm not. I think that. I think that's the the way that I would struggle with it. Yeah. It. I. I tried it um, a couple of times, and and also trying to put the punctuation in. It. It didn't feel very flowy. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost. It, it is felt like very you're di- dictating stilted. a letter to your secretary or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was very stilted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's pause there to take a quick break and grab a review in this week's Book Bloggers Corner. Today, Catherine Sunderland, aka Bibliomaniac, is reviewing Twin Truths by Sheelan Roger. This is the BBC Book Bloggers Corner. Twin Truths by Sheelan Roger. What is the truth and how do you recognise it when you hear it? Jenny and Pippa are twins. Like many twins, they often know what the other is thinking. They complete each other. When Pippa disappears, Jenny is left to face the world alone as she tries to find out what happened to her other half. But the truth for Jenny can be a slippery thing. Having read The Yellow Room by Sheila and Roger last year, I was very keen to read anything else she wrote and was delighted to be offered Twin Truths. Once again, I found myself relishing Roger's writing style. Her prose is immersive, absorbing and poetic. She creates interesting characters and through a storyline that is partly a thriller, partly a coming-of-age novel and partly something much more psychologically complex, she explores challenging themes like identity, loss and love with an admirable creativity and depth. The use of twins really gives Rogers a chance to play with language as well as play with the reader and to develop characters who are brilliantly and intricately interwoven, adding a whole new layer of depth to the novel. The first half of the book focuses on Jenny and her arrival in Argentina as she tries to find out what happened to her sister. The narrative voice is endearing, sometimes more flippant and sometimes a little disjointed, but always cleverly conveying the emotional state of Jenny, as well as reflecting the intimate relationship she had with her twin. Part two goes back in time to the girl's childhood, and the narrative is much more linear. I really enjoyed this part of the novel and finding out about their relationship, their past and the dynamics between them. Roger is not an author who shies away from difficult subjects and there are scenes and events that are emotive and traumatic but intrinsic to the plot and, as always, well executed through an accomplished use of language. There are lines to savour, images to reread and appreciate and a fluency to the prose which is almost entrancing. And alongside this are characters that are intriguing and a storyline that keeps the reader engaged from the opening line. It seems a tall order but it is one met with utter ease from the writer, who is definitely one to watch. I recommend. Book Bloggers Corner. There you go. That was Twin Truths by Sheelan Roger, and you can find a link to that in the show notes, along with a link to Catherine's blog, where you can find loads of great book reviews and recommendations. So let's get back to my chat with Rebecca Bradley, where I asked Rebecca a little more about her planning process. So what about the actual process in terms of like planning? Uh, do, do you are you really heavily plot? Do you like to have exactly a proper roadmap of where you're going or do you just go, right, here's this initial idea, let's just run with it? Well, I think the re- real reason that it took me two years or more to write Shallow Waters was I was a pantser. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I knew how it started. I knew how it was going to end mm-hmm. and I didn't know anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, because I was researching um, how to write and um, all that kind of thing mm-hmm. while I was writing it, mm-hmm. um, I realised, oh, you can actually 
plot a novel. Mm -hmm. So after that, for the second one, uh, Made to be Broken, I thought I'd try plotting. Mm -hmm. And now I've found out that actually I prefer to plot um, mm. the novels out. It's much easier. Um, so, But I'm still a little bit of both. I'll plot most of it, but there'll be gaps where I don't really know. I've got the general gist of where it's going, but there'll be gaps um, where I'll just have to type my way through it. But, um, and that's probably, oh. the, yeah, that makes it a bit more enjoyable. Yeah. But I do, like, I do like having a plan to work to. It does make it um, so much easier to sit down and just get going, especially because I've only got those short periods to go into the office and work in. Yeah, I was going to say that. I found that with the having switched to these kind of shorter sessions myself I do need to kind of have an idea of where I'm going I mean I would by no means describe myself as a a, a plotter as such but I think I have as time's gone on I've moved more towards at least having some kind of idea of where I'm going I usually start off and get going with the thing so that I know I've got the enthusiasm and I've got the characters and I think, okay, I like this world. And then I think, right, you need to kind of stop for a second, think about where you're going. But for de but definitely in terms of, okay, the 20 minutes that I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to work on this or that chapter or that scene or whatever. Um, because you can waste 20 minutes just thinking about what you're, yeah. what you're going to write. Yeah. Have you read the book, Take Off Your Pants? No, I haven't. No. I can't remember who the author is. Um, I and can, the book is not on my bedside table. I'll be able to Google it. What's it called? Take off your pants. Take off your pants. I should be and careful what, what I Google. There, I could get anything. What you what <laughs> what that brings up? Um, yeah, it is about plotting. It's about not being a pantser anymore. Take off your pants. Yeah, it's take, only a slim book, but it's really good. Take off your pants. Outline your books for faster, better writing. That's the by one. Libby Hawker. Okay, that's yeah, I'll, 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 that's that's a good tip. That looks good. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll yeah. pop I'll pop a note to that uh, note in the uh, show notes. I find that really helpful. And that kind of helped you made the transition. Yeah, that's uh, that's really really good. So you've said about so you've got in terms of what you've got coming up next. Then so you've got um, the standalone comes out in May. When's the fourth Hannah Robbins coming out? Well, I'm hoping to finish the first draft by the end of April. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to leave that to sit for a while while I draft another standalone. Um, so I'm hoping to have Hannah 4 out later this year sometime. So the stand, so Dead Blind will be out in May and then Hannah 4 will be out later this year. No specifics yet. You don't want to get yeah. people too excited and then they'll be bothering you when it doesn't come out on that precise date. How do you yeah. go about that? As definitely regards... this year. Yeah, definitely this year. I mean, how do you go about that with with you being indie, an indie publisher? Uh, you know, you're publishing it yourself. Do you, how so, how far ahead do you tend to put out? Do you put things out of a pre-order and things like that? I know that some indie publishers do that as a way to kind of give themselves a kick up the backside and say, I've got to have yeah. it done by that. Um very relaxed it's been so far. Um, Fighting Monsters wasn't on pre-order, but I have got Dead Blind on pre-order. But I don't have the cover yet until um, probably early next week. So mm. it's just sat there with no cover and I've not really announced that it's there. I'm with you, yeah. Um, so probably by the time this podcast comes out in a few weeks, that yeah. will probably be up there with a nice oh, cover and stuff. truly up there with a cover and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um so, but once it gets the cover, then I'll announce that it's it's on Amazon with a um, with a cover. Um, but there's there's always a debate um, raging within the indie community on whether pre-orders are the right way to go, or whether releasing it and letting people know on the day is the right way to go, because it's about which is the best way to for it to get up the Amazon rankings mm -hmm. on release day. So. Yeah, um, yeah, there's a jury out on that at the moment. Does, yeah, I think it is. Well, I suppose half the problem is with anything that's like Amazon algorithm or Google Am or, uh, algorithm or anything is, apart from anything else, they're constantly changing it, aren't they? You can't really yeah. rely on anything for very long. Yeah. I know, I yeah. know with like Google search, um, you know, over the years, 
you'd get you'd get like a guru on SEO or whatever and they say oh yeah you need to do this you've got to put loads of keywords in your copy and this that and the other and then six months later you'll be like oh no that doesn't work anymore Google doesn't, doesn't work like that anymore Change it's to it. do with yeah. content and everything else so you know you do kind of have to presumably especially if you're doing everything yourself and you're taking a big uh, responsibility with all the marketing and promotion yourself you just, that's something else you have to keep on top of is it yeah, there's, there's so many things that you have to remember to do. Um, so um, when you've got one, uh, a book coming out, the best thing you can do is keep a, a, a running list of everything you've got to do. So um, organising a blog tour, organising the cover, of organising your editors, um, organising the art copies, you your early advanced readers to get their copies so they've gone out already people are reading it um let's see if any bloggers want review copies mm -hmm. um so it's about it's about being organized and keeping that list and, and just trying to keep on top of yourself and obviously you it's from the sounds of it as well you're learning something new with each with each thing you put out yes um yeah, I think you do, to be honest. Um, there was such a big gap between the second one and the third one, so it felt, when I released Fighting Monsters, it kind of felt like a fresh start and like I was starting all over again. So these two books have, have felt like I've kind of started all over again, uh, and it's been really interesting. I've enjoyed it, actually. Mm, fresh challenge. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. All right, well, as we kind of wrap things up, so where just tell people where they can find you online. You mentioned that you're, um, you're very social on the old social media, so tell us where they can find you on there and where your uh, website and stuff is. Uh, my website is rebeccabradleycrime.com, and you can pick yourself up a free novella on there. If you're a crime writer, I just, I don't know whether you saw yesterday, I set up a crime writers group for people that are maybe interested in getting police documents, um, you can. There was a blog post. Oh right, I'll put a link to it today. I'll, tr I'll on, create a on, static page yeah, for and it. And that's on your. Is that? Can you access that off your website? Can you? You can get that on my website. Um, I'll, I'll give you the link for it. Yeah. Um, where every month I will send you a police document, so you can create your own folder of documents. So. You've got this research folder for while you're writing a crime novel, oh. and this, you, when you sign up, you get a an MG11 police statement, and I've filled it in as a character, but it's as a police officer will have written it mm -hmm. um, of an incident that happened in one of the books. Um, so it's as a police, it's in police speak, so you can see a police statement in police speak for signing up, and that's the first months item that you get and then next month i'll send something else and the month after etc etc yeah that's brilliant i'll definitely put a link in well you're going to hang around for the epilogue anyway and in the epilogue i did yeah. want to talk i wanted to talk to you a little bit about um your police procedural fact checking service because that's specifically for the thing you mentioned there as well is, is specifically for crime writers that's great so i'll we'll we'll talk about that as well a little bit more in the epilogue okay. so yeah that's and great you can also, and you can also find me on uh, twitter at Rebecca J. Bradley. Brilliant. I'll put, it, put that in the show notes as well. Well, for the time being, Rebecca, thanks a million. It's been really, really good talking to you, and uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, Wayne. It's been great. There you go. That was Rebecca Bradley, and you can grab a copy of her latest book, Fighting Monsters, right now, and I'll put a link to all of those things in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogues of interviews on the website. And as I mentioned earlier, make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts from, and you can have the show downloaded automatically every week. Also, remember to read the latest blog posts over at joinedupwriting.co.uk and leave me some feedback and I'll give you a mention in a future show. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly, happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up.